Welcome. I'm glad you could be here. Uh, we can have some fun. Uh, I, I, I hope you have a sense of humor uh, about what, what you do. You're going to need it in your career. Uh, a large part of what I like to do is think about uh, the human condition and, and uh, how it relates to our shared misery. I've, I've got a couple of books out uh, that are flexibility books. And in the, in the new one that I, that I wrote, um, in the, in the forward, I wanted to point out that um, these books, the, the things that I write for my students and for, uh, for other players, are not for me to sound better, they're actually for you to sound worse. Um, and so, and then that way, the elevate, you know, the relative between us is less uh, in some way. So, uh, I wanted to, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about flexibility and a little bit of the philosophy of of constructing it and of practicing it, but I'd like to maybe take a minute and talk about how how that ties into how you actually practice anything, whether it's a flexibility or a technical study or a piece of music, and uh, I, and I think it goes to uh, and then then when you're practicing something that has to do with the, that you'd call a flexibility exercise, you might have a, a, a more of a refined idea of of what it is you're trying to do when you practice that, so. Uh, I thought of the idea for the things that I do in my books in 1988, the first time I started listening to Woody Shaw. I started to think about the relationship of the trumpet to harmony. And if you want to think about like a flexibility exercise that we all do, are you, you guys are, are you familiar with like the Earl Irons book, the 27 groups? It was one of the first, it was the first Lipsler group that, uh, book that I had. And, and there were some heart-stopping moments like this. Right? We know that one. It's on the hit parade. And then if we get really crazy... Right? Okay. So, the, the benefits to doing flexibility exercises like that are understood to be uh, universal. Everybody, everyone will tell you. Every every teacher says you got to do some some version of that, and it's going to help you technically and musically and physically coordination, um, uh, the, the, your ability to, to play music around the horn. So, um, if you want to think about that in terms of the instrument, however, and what it's capable of doing, um, it would be like if you played the bass, and we're only going to do flexibility exercises on one string at a time. Okay, so in other words, uh, the types of things I started writing and thinking about was inter um, commingling the various partials that we have. So on the first book, I have a, I have a, I have a uh, exercise. The book actually starts out like this. So what I did was I put first position and second position together to make flexibility exercises that um, uh, nobody showed me how to do that. I just thought, man, what if I took the chocolate and the peanut butter, the open and then the second valve, and I, we put those together. And then you start to explore the harmonic pop, uh, possibilities with something like that, and it gets, uh, it gets to be pretty interesting. So um, before I get to sort of the process of that, I've been doing writing flexibility exercises since about 2012. Even though the uh, the idea that I mentioned with Woody Shaw is more of a harmonic and technical idea, I I, uh, I wrote my first book on Facebook, one post half a page at a time and posted them. Does anybody remember when I was doing that? It was sort of it was sort of out there and in, in many respects, uh, Lipsler World Headquarters in Cincinnati. All right, that's where I'm writing from. But um, but I, I did want to talk about just sort of the fundamentals of practice because I think they're not well, I don't want to say well understood, I don't think they're well defined for most people. And if you're like I used to be, you may either dread practice uh, or like outright not enjoy it and uh, find it extremely frustrating. And I think one of the reasons that that may be the case is that number one, you don't have a really good well-defined idea of what success, what constitutes success 
in the course of a practice session or even a small uh, portion of your practice. And then, generally speaking, uh, when what you're trying to do, the expectations, musical or technical, are too far beyond what you're actually able to do. So that might be tempo or range. It might be uh, some sort of technical thing where the piece of music you're trying to negotiate is actually not in line with your abilities and you're attempting to do something that's too far beyond what you're able to learn in that session or even to make significant progress to, uh, uh, towards. So when we get back to how to actually practice stuff, we have to define what practice is and then what the point of it is and what the end result is. And then we also have to kind of look and say, okay, how would we know that whether or not we're actually getting somewhere towards that uh, goal, towards those goals. All right, so if I were to ask a question, and I do this with my students, and I do it with when I do clinics and master classes and, and, and the like, if I would ask a student, uh, what, why do we practice? That should be that we should define our terms. Why do you practice? Um, what, would be the, what would be the number one? If we were on Family Feud, you know what Family Feud, do they still have Family Feud? All right, Richard Dawson died though. Who's doing it now? Steve, Har Steve Harvey, isn't it? Anyway, you know Family Food, they got the number one answer. Well, what's the number one answer? Get to get better, right? Does that sound reasonable? Great. Yeah, I, 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 that's, that's the same thing that chicken soup is supposed to help you when you got the flu, right? <coughs> to get better. Okay, but unfortunately, like a lot of terms that we, we throw around, uh, getting better really doesn't help because we don't have any way of really measuring what that means or really even defining it. So um, that doesn't really, so if we try to narrow it down, get better at what, I guess would be the question. At the trumpet. At the trumpet. Okay, that's the number one answer, number two answer that goes with that. Everybody agree to get better at the trumpet? And you go, eh. Uh, we play music, right? So if we sit down and we're going to try to conquer that, it's not going to work. Um, I have some rules for trumpet playing there in, in my second book, uh, and one of them says uh, the trumpet is, is, is stupid, is dumb. Number, right after that, the next rule is you can't outthink it. All right, you, you, so if you go in with the idea that I'm going to try to conquer the trumpet, you're going to, you're going to be in for a, a bit of a, uh, a long road. Now, um, for, for, to, to move things along so that we're not you know, treading water here, uh, the way I define it is, is uh, I want to practice to make playing musical lines easier. Whatever the musical line, if it's easier uh, to render, then I have, uh, I have options. I can phrase it. I can play it maybe in tune with somebody else. I can follow a conductor. I can improvise with it. I can shade it in different ways. Sergei Nikiriakov talks about the, was the third page of the Hummel where there doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on. And he was saying, you know, these are where I find these little colors, these little things that I can shade and, and, uh, and uh, create style with them, even though they're just little gestures. All right. If you, most of us go into the idea of learning a piece of music to get it to where we can play it. If I can play it at all, I'll be happy. And then we go into the, uh, go into the performance and say, I hope I play well. Meaning, if you don't, then it will be an unsuccessful performance. I would hope you would go into your performance and say, I hope I play like I usually do, which I'll be okay. Might not be my best day. Hopefully it won't be my worst day. But even in that case, I'll probably be, I'll probably be okay. Does that make sense? All right. So to that end, the easier it is to play the music you're about to render, the, the more fun it's going to be, the less stress it's going to be. All right. So if we take that as, as the, uh, the baseline for practicing, uh, then it's a whole other thing. It's a whole other thing. Uh, it's not weightlifting, and it's not total music. It's just what do I need to do to make musical lines easier to play? And that's a different, that's a different definition. So when I work with students and we talk about flexibility, so, uh, the great thing about flexibility is that for you to do, to get around it without using your tongue as a, as a crutch, uh, you, you have to be able to know where the notes are and how to get back and forth between them. So uh, if I had, if you guys had your horns, and I had you demonstrate uh, these three notes. Now, 
Now, I just played that, and if, if I give myself a test, and I say, was the sound okay? It was okay. It's what I usually sound like. I could play it 10 more times, it'd probably still sound the same. Was it, was it consistent? Yeah. I mean, we'll know if I'd try it again, right? Um, is it repeatable? Could I do 10 of those in a row and get the same result and feel pretty confident about that? I hope so. I think so. Um, was it in time? Well, we didn't have a metronome going on, but I was with the conductor, which just happened to be me. All right? So I'll say it matches all three things that I really would want to whether or not something was, was um, acceptable. So I never have to practice. Do I have? I never have to practice those three notes that way again, right? Well, because you're in the same position when you sit down and play. You ask yourself a question. Am I done? Was that it? The question is, was that it? And the answer is no. It's almost always going to be no, by the way. But it can be close. So I would ask you start with one really important question. And this can define everything that you do. And I've never heard anybody say it this way. Um, so if you use this in your teaching, or if you use this as a part of your practicing, so you've got to send me a nickel every time you do it. All right? If it's unsuccessful, I'm not going to send you a nickel, because it's free. Um, what would this feel like if it were easy? What would it feel like to play this phrase of music if it were easy? All right? And you have to ask yourself, did that meet what that question is asking? So f for me, um, one of the things that I want to know to define whether a musical line is easy to play or easier to play is are the notes closer together by the end of my practice. So in other words, what I gave you was this. And when I think about making the notes closer together, that means mentally, musically, and physically. So what I really want is All right. So now the notes are not but I'm as my as I do the repetitions, the repetitions are refining. The refining method, method that I'm using is Take, taking the position, physical position of the first note, it's here. I can feel the C. It's right there. Can you feel the C? Pretend to put up your horn. Can you feel where a C is? About the tension, about the body feel. All right? So that's, that's a C. So what I want to do is I want to go to a G, but I want to go to a G with the smallest possible distance and still have the feeling of the first note in my face. <laughs> And I know I can do it because I can pop right back up to it at any time. It's right there. And to me, the way I've practiced over the years, I've tried to make that distance smaller and smaller. Okay? That's going to come in real handy when we're doing larger intervals. If I want to do... Right now, that's a big interval. So when I'm practicing a tenth, as I'm doing the repetitions, I'm trying to figure out where the common ground is in the set. And while I'm doing that, I'm not having much success. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a little bit of a checklist. I'm going to go, OK, well, what's really happening here? Because for me to play this note, in my body in terms of the amount of support or pressurization or compression, however you want to think about it, that's different than So my second rule, or uh, not rule, but uh, criteria for is the music getting easier to play on your instrument? Are the notes closer together? And then is there an absence of physical tension that's, that's like a, 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 um, where you feel there's a push? So I can see it in my students, I can see it in other players, where you'll go, 
uh. And so you need to be able to practice in such a way that while you're practicing these intervals, you're practicing a piece of music, you're paying attention to your body and feeling for right? Now the problem is, is that when you're doing things wrong or inefficiently on your instrument, it's invisible or it's mainly invisible. So you have to pay attention to the, the physical cues that you're getting from your body. Your, my body's telling me, I can feel that happening. So it's telling me that if I were in a car, my gas pedal for the first note has to go too far to get to the next note. And if you give the gas, too much gas in a car, you're going to get that hesitation. So that means I have to be active in my body enough that when I've pressurized the air inside, I'm supporting it in such a way that it's already, there's already enough pressure to play the second note. Okay, as I'm practicing something like that, I'm going through kind of a physical mental checklist to see if it feels easy yet or if they feel closer together. I would go through that entire process for a while and as I'm doing it, I'm keeping another th a couple of other things in mind that go back to a main philosophy of practicing. Um, so, the, uh, how many of you guys have like a routine that you do every day, right? Okay. Um, if you're, uh, one thing I will say, you, uh, routine is a necessary uh, precondition for consistency, which is a necessary precondition for excellence. Um, but if the routine stays too routine, it, it, it works the opposite. It works in the opposite direction. So once you get consistent, and you may get relatively excellent, uh, if you keep doing the same crap for the next 30 years, uh, it's not going to help you as much. Now the reason I'm saying this is because I did that. <laughs> I did the same crap for about 30 years. And I'm like, man, nah, I don't seem to be improving like I did in, in college or when I was working on a lot of rep new rep uh, repertoire. So I started to think a lot about you know, what I was actually practicing and how I was practicing. So um, I'm going to throw you a couple, this is how we're doing for time. Um, good. I want to give you a couple of uh, concepts that all go together with this and they're going to come back into uh, the flexibility part. Uh, I have a, a concept that I call chop neutral. And the idea is, is that when you practice, when most of us practice, we practice ourselves out especially younger players. So if you practice for an hour, you're done. And if you are not careful, you might be done for the day. And if you can imagine, um, a lot of people like to go to the gym in the morning before work or before school. The equivalent is going to the gym and working out so hard that you can't walk to school or walk to work for the rest of the day. And when that happens, um, it has to do a large part with, in large part with what you consider pacing, but it also has to do with uh, understanding what it should feel like to play. And if you're doing it right, I would like to think that after one hour of practice, you'd just be getting warmed up. You'd feel like, yeah, I'm getting stronger. All right. And if that's not happening in your practice, that means that's a you problem. You have to do something about that. You can't just keep doing it year in year out and go. Well, you know, my teacher said I should do it this way, so I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. You have to be, uh, you have to be responsive to the results. Okay? So the idea of chop neutral comes from scuba diving. Are you guys, anybody a scuba diver? All right. The idea of neutral buoyancy. What you do when you, when you scuba dive, when you're learning to scuba dive, is you have a, a, a vest that has air in it, and you've got a weight belt, and you're constantly adjusting the amount of air in your vest to sink or to, uh, to, to float. Okay, so when you're when you're working on it, you go down 20 feet of water and you sit or stand there on the bottom of the ocean. I, I was uh, I used to work on cruise ships, so I I did this in um, in a lagoon in St. Thomas with a hangover. Um, <laughs> so I'm not doing this clinic with a hangover. I did the scuba diving in, in a long time ago. Anyway, um, so you're standing there uh, and and you got your instructor there and they say, okay, what you want to do is is you want to lean forward. You sort of like lean forward on, in the water and you try to get to where you're at 45 degrees. All right, at 45 degrees and then you kick your legs up and you do this. And what you're doing is you're neither sinking nor uh, 
rising, you're neutral, okay? It's a really good analogy for what we're trying to do when we're practicing, especially the technical exercises. I don't want to feel like uh, I'm playing too lightly and it's, you know, I don't have enough contact with what I'm doing or too softly. I want to make sure it's just right in the middle, but I'm not spending a bunch of chops, okay? So this is important. So this, what ends up happening is when you apply it to your face, basically we're talking about your lips, your face. Uh, I, everything comes back to Clark to uh, number 37 or number 38. All right, so as you're playing that, the reason you play it, and by the way, that's 1911, right? So if Herbert L. Clark were alive today, what would he be practicing? I don't know what he'd be practicing, but I'd say pretty strong conviction it sure wouldn't be Clark II, number 37. He'd have, he'd have moved on, all right? But a lot of us don't ever move on. Most of us don't ever move on. So I think, well, I write my own Clark studies. Um, why? Because I'm bored. Aren't you bored? That's another reason why you're not enjoying practicing as much as you might. Because you're bored and you don't even know it. All right, you're just doing the same stuff and then uh, uh, you're not using your own creativity um, to make it interesting or your own imagination. So I take the same pattern. I've just played the same pattern but I played it on the relative minor. Um, that gets me into F sharp that gets me moving along and I'm still playing Clark II physically but I'm not playing the same notes and that's where it comes in it all comes back to that if you're still playing if you can understand read what Clark said in a, in a version prior to 1980 not the one with the three languages the very first exercise Clark won it says all of these exercises are to be play, played as softly as possible okay so to me that means I probably should play these softly. All the things that Clark says in his book say, if you do what I say according to the, uh, to the instructions contained herein, um, you will be able to play anything that, that is, that, what does he say, in, way, in, uh, in terms of the musical, um, uh, I'm paraphrasing, musical challenges uh, that you might come up against. All right? So again, we're talking about how to practice so that you're not practicing yourself out. And, and I know this, that I, the, the way it didn't work, why it didn't work for me is because I never had this in my chops, never had elasticity. I never felt like my chops were elastic, all right? And that's something that I think we, we think, oh, well, I'm just sore, or I'm tired, or I played a lot yesterday, and they're just going to be stiff. Um, yeah, not so much, okay? So the idea with this is, is that I'm practicing, and it doesn't matter if I'm going to practice that or if I might take a, an interval exercise where I do some fourths. As I'm playing that, that's a Woody Shaw pattern, um, he goes from low F sharp to high F, I'm good for about uh, a ninth, a minor ninth before I have to turn around and run back down to a home base. Um, but we're DNA, we're, our DNA as trumpet players is, is in, it, Clark is in it. These little circular kinds of um, exercises, ways of learning technique that come back upon themselves that let us do circular repetitions. But while I'm doing that, I can still be chop neutral. Now, whatever the other thing that goes with chop neutral is as I'm playing, you know. I'm playing, I'm spending chops. And the chops go down. I'm spending them. This is a chop meter, by the way. Chop meter, right? Okay. And that's full. That's the tank. And as I'm practicing, I'm going, can I do this all day? Yeah. Play for a while. And then I stop. I do this. is a real, really cool thing. You should try it. I stop playing. I put the trumpet down. And then I go, how's that chop meter doing? Getting better. I'm not going to... Uh, 
if I do this for 20 seconds in front of you guys, it seems like an eternity. And it seems like an eternity to you when you're in a practice room. Most of you think you rest, but you don't. You just stop playing for a moment and then you keep going. All right. So to keep me from doing that, I time my rest. I never time, I very seldom time my practice. I time my rests. So I might do some chickowitz, just like you guys do. Or I might do a stamp, or I might do some pedal tones or whatever. And then I take a three minute or a two minute or one, I, I have a, a timer app that has probably 10 different timers. And in each one of those timers, um, I, I know which one I'm going to do between my exercises or between my reps. And I drink coffee, I update my status. <laughs> and, uh, and I can practice like this pretty much all day. All right. Now, how does that translate into, say, something like flexibility? Um, and again, those, those exercises that I was just doing, while I'm doing that, I, I know that. I wrote it. So I'm not thinking about the notes. That's a joke, by the way. Um, and uh, while I'm playing it, I have enough wherewithal to go behind the horn and go, hmm, how are my chops? They're okay. And I'm not coming toward, the, the mouthpiece is not coming towards me. And I'm trying to play in such a way that I can continue to do so three minutes from now. All right? So no matter what we're practicing, if we have the same set of criteria for what the, the idea is, whether it's flexibility or technique or tonguing or whatever you want, um, the, overall, the overarching part is sort of the effortlessness of what's going on, all right? So then that gets us, you know, as we're moving here, to the, the idea of, of flexibility, okay? Uh, uh, my favorite quote about flexibility is from Vince DiMartino. Is Vince, anybody seen him today? I've been looking for him. I haven't seen him. But anyway, Vince says you can, um, you can slur without tonguing, but you can't tongue without slurring. So in other words, to get from one note to the other, the air must work as a slur, whether or not you're tonguing it. All right? The rest is just, uh, is just figuring out how to connect the notes. So what we're doing when we're playing and practicing is, is we don't have to put the notes in a certain place. A G is, is there. It, that's where the note is. My job isn't to put it there. My job is to remember how to get there. All right? And that's a different, that's a different uh, a way of thinking of things. So let's get back to a few flexibilities. So instead of playing them on one string, like that, I decided I wanted to make them more interesting for myself to practice. Still, the idea here is to combine and move around some partials and make, some, make a, uh, something that sounds interesting, at least to me. So next book, the second book, it's got stuff like this. Whatever, I can't remember it. I wrote it. All right. So that's just that and that. And then that and then that. And then that and then that. Um, but for some reason, nobody put those two together for me, so I had to write my own stuff. Right? And that's made my practicing much more interesting because, uh oh, watch out, microphone. Um, now I can start to think about how can I practice those with chop neutral with the idea that I'm going to be able to do it for quite some time. All right. So um, I'll just grab one of these. Um, if I want to work on the lower register, I've got one here. I've got a couple of yoga themed. Um, this one's called uh, Downward Facing Doggy Bag. And it has, uh, first of all, this is, I guess this is technically a world premiere performance of this because this just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, nobody ever wrote a lip slur in 10, and nobody ever wrote a yoga themed, doggy bag themed uh, lip slur. So I'm going to take three, I'm going to take three partials and I'm going to put them together like this. 
I should have worn my reading glasses. I can't see anything. That's great. Let's uh, let's move it. Now again, I'm not spending a bunch of chops to do this, and when I stop to talk to you, it feels pretty fresh. Now, the second one of those, and these go all the way down, and they, they go through these uh, uh, two. The bottom of the horn. Or you might go something like this. Et cetera, et cetera. You get the, uh, you get the idea, right? Um, now let's invert it. You know what an inversion is? Yeah. Okay. Go back. To, uh, go. You're not getting to class often enough for uh, for this. Let's turn it upside down. Uh, let's see which one is this. All right. So um, that's the same thing. I just took all of the patterns and I reversed them, the direction of them, but the same. Fingering pattern is just one, two, three, one, two, three. While I'm doing these things, as I'm making the repetitions, I'm thinking, are they getting a little closer together? And the answer is, hopefully, when I do, when I do it, they do. Um, this one is entitled, Two Schlickets to Tossberg. Also a joke punchline. <laughs> Right, okay. They keep going down like that. Uh, the last one of the lower group is. All right. Those go up into some very interesting partials. I'm going to show you something here that, that this is how I work on. Um, my upper register. Uh, the first thing I do when I was working on this as a uh, as, an, as something for a lead trumpet playing, which is what I've done a lot of the last 20 years, is the concept of a slot. You guys heard of slots? Clicks and slots. So from my standpoint, the idea of there are two kinds of slurs. There's a musical slur. <laughs> where you're trying to make it not sound like it's tongued, right? Sorry. My wild Irish rose, she never blows her nose. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that that's the correct lyric, but my dad always used to sing that. He's still alive, but I, don't, I haven't heard him sing that one in a while. Anyway, and then that's a, the idea of that kind of a slur, flexibility, is for it not to click, not to, not to pop out. Um, most people try to build their register in their upper range. The, I call it the county fair ring the bell version, where you go up the scale and you try to hit the high note. And then you go back up the scale and you try to hit the high note. And you're trying to ring the bell, gung. Right? And I'm going to get that half step. And, and the, the harder you hit it, the more you work, the more likely you are to get strong enough eventually to ring the bell. That's great, but the problem is, is that's not the way it really works. And maybe it works for you. It never worked for me. I tried it for about six years. I'll save you six years. Okay. I started doing exercises in the upper register that were flexibility exercises that were taught to me by a guy named Dominic Spera who used to teach at Indiana University, and, um, and also it's a combination of what Vince DiMartino did, does. And the idea here is to make the partials, one next to each other, pop, such as this. Can you hear the pop? Can you hear it? Can you hear it click? Maybe I should play louder. I don't like to, but I'll do it just for, the, for this. Can 
Can you hear the little pop? I, I hope you can hear that. I can hear it. The, sh the fourth degree of that is going to be super sharp, practically Lydian. Okay? So as you go up the, in the upper register, can you hear the pop? Can you hear it? I can hear it, right? And it's like you're running your, you know what a Venetian blind is? It's like you're running your finger up a Venetian blind, the edge of a blind, a window blind. All right? And so um, this is part of flexibility. As I practice it, I take a break, and I go, OK. I can move on to the next one. In the interest of time, there are some of these in this book. I call them slots of luck. And uh, they, should be, they should be called slots of gold, I guess. Uh, but uh, the idea is you, you're, you're, you're dealing with upper register as a technique, not as a function of strength or volume. And the highest note that you can click, or the highest note that I can click on a given day, I would call my upper, where, where my, my range is. Okay, so there's a little bit, a little bit slidey as I get from the F to the G, but um, I'm practicing up there, and I have a mission. I'm trying to get the notes to click. If they're not clicking, I don't proceed past them, right? So once I get those to click in, we, we're now in technique land. It becomes easy. Um, it seems like it's really hard at first, and then it gets easier. I don't want to go, so I'll do it this way. So the B flat is uh, not, it's not clicking, right? You can hear it slide. So if you write, you with me? It's like, right? Um, so when I'm going to work on that, I'm trying to get that to click. Now, I don't jump in and just do that. I've been doing this for like 30 years. Um, yeah, one minute? All right, cool. Anyway, the idea with all this is, is that I'm using the same criteria for the upper register as much as possible. Is that can I bring the, can I bring the, the range together? A way to do that, and I'll do one more demonstration, is with a gliss. We're going. <laughs> So I'm going from a low C to a G. How about this one? As I'm doing those, I'm trying to compress the distance between the bottom note and the top note. Now that, I'm just kind of messing around. I don't have to do that. But I'm trying to create the smallest distance between two notes. And if those two notes are an octave apart or two octaves apart, that's the, that's the concept of what's going on with that. The, the smallest distance between two notes, any two notes, I call a Vizzuti unit. It's one, it's one Vizzuti. All right? Now, a VU. All right? And we actually started seven minutes late, but uh, give me just a second. All right? Um, the VU is important because the reason Alan Vizzuti can play the way he does is because he tries to play the way that he does, by the way. And he tries to play the music that he's trying to play. But that's an octave. Or whatever. That's what Alan Vizzuti's doing. I told him about this. He didn't seem too impressed. Um, <laughs>
mildly amused, I guess, was the thing we were having. It was at a breakfast. I said, oh, by the way, I got a theory about things. I call the shortest distance a VU. He's like, yeah, all right. Um, rest of us mortals find it a little bit more, more relatable. But, um, but imagine what it would feel like if it were easy. That's the point. That's the point of being able to go from a low C to a high G or to a double C or whatever like that. If it's got to feel something that's relatable to your existence. And if it doesn't, if, it's, if you're feeling this way on regular technical studies, or uh, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> right? We know that. Might still sound OK. So you're going to understand that there's a better way to do the process. You can have a good result with a bad process. Oh, it sounded wonderful. It hurt. Um, it, it sounds good, feels good. It's sustainable, all right? So anyway, that's all I got to say. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing the, uh, the Army Herald trumpets. Thank you for giving me a couple of minutes to talk.